I really do not, do not understand what all the to-do about as far as people falling asleep. It happens every Sunday. <laughs> I see it all the time. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say. It's nothing new. But it was nice to have the fellowship. It was nice all the, the good food and uh, the desserts. They were very good. I'm very thankful for that. The lesson uh, for some of you this afternoon will be about commendations, exhorting. And the scriptures are full of the importance of exhorting one another. We noticed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, a, I want to say a couple of months ago, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Even as you're already doing these things, keep on doing them. Every once in a while in looking up a word, I like to go just to a regular old dictionary to see how close that they come to the definition, a biblical definition to the word. And I've often been amazed that sooner or later you will find it. It may not be the first one, but according to Webster's, it was. Webster's uh, dictionary defined the word edify as to instruct or improve spiritually. Well, that's, that's spot on. And of course here, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it is in the verb form. If you remember when you went to school, some of you, like, well, never mind. A uh, number of years ago, that meant continuous action. It wasn't a one-time event. So we are to continue to edify. Spiro Z, in his lexicon, said that it means to cause to advance in the divine light. I like that. To cause someone to advance, to encourage someone to continue into that divine light. Metaphorically, it means to, to build up. And in the American Standard Version, that's how it is stated. Wherefore, comfort one another and build each other up, even as also ye do. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another, Romans 14, 19, and including, and that's everything, including even our speech we are to use to edify. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, Ephesians 4, 29. This is a very important work of the church. We need people to encourage, to edify. We need people to encourage in a number of ways, like reminding someone that they have the closing prayer this Sunday afternoon. I'm not going to name his name. He knows. But we all, you know, we know that we're not supposed to pat ourselves on the back, but it is good to pat others on the back for a job well done, for continuing to remain steadfast, to try different things as our brother John has done. We need to continue to encourage him, and he encourages us by being faithful as well. Barnabas, you remember his name meant son of consolation or son of exhortation. He was an exhorter. It was Barnabas who was the one who went to Tarsus to get Saul to come back with him to do the work there at the church there at Antioch. And then he and Barnabas went on that first missionary journey. And even in a second one, Barnabas was an encourager to John Mark who quit on that first trip. Barnabas didn't give up on him. 
Paul did. Paul was wrong, and he come to realize that. Read the Second Timothy chapter four and the comments that he makes about John. That we need to be a Barnabas. We need to encourage one another, to command one another. And when we think about commending, what about the commendations that our Lord and Savior gave to individuals during his time? Can we learn from that? Of course we can. And I'm not going to mention all of them, but there'll be about four that we'll look at this morning. The first example of that is a man called Nathaniel, who was a disciple, would become a disciple of Jesus, would become an apostle of Jesus. And the first time that they met, John 1, Jesus looked at him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. What's guile mean? Deceit, trickery, hypocrisy, which the Jewish leaders at this period of time, basically they reveled in. And Jesus condemned them more than once about their guile, their trickery, their deceit, their hypocrisy. Read Matthew chapter 23. A true Israelite, what did that mean? What does it mean when he said, an Israelite indeed? One who actually practiced what he professed. One who lived faithful according to the law of Moses at that period of time. That was Nathaniel. And when he came to Jesus, it seemed like he knew him. And Jesus did know him. He knew what was in Nathanael's heart. He knew what was in man, John 2, 25. So this was high praise that Jesus gave to Nathanael. And he could read somebody's heart, their mind. It showed his deity. Only God can do that. But he was able to do that. And of course, Nathanael asked, well, how do you know me? We've never met before. And in verse 48, he stated before that Philip called thee. You remember Philip came to Nathaniel and basically said, we found the Christ. That's what he was talking about. Jesus tells him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Verse 48. He saw him. Again, he was God. In the flesh of man. And that's all it took for Nathaniel to believe what Philip had stated to him. That he was the son of God. That he was the king of Israel. Verse 49. You think of the importance of that commendation. And how can it apply to us today? Think about on the day of judgment. Standing before our Lord and Savior. And looking upon us, naming our name and saying, a Christian indeed. Truly a Christian indeed. That will be a great compliment, a great commendation. And that's something that, of course, we all want to hear. That is something that we all want to strive for. That is why we're going to stay awake during the sermon this afternoon. I already see it. It's happening. Don't make me call names. The other account, and this is kind of a favorite of mine, is this the poor widow for her liberality. This is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. I, I preached on this uh, a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to belabor the point too much, but a little bit. Some things that I left out. You remember this is the account where Jesus is in the temple and he has his disciples with him 
And you just think about him just watching how people come in and cast into the treasury. He's watching how they give. And he's watching these people who are rich or well-to-do, and they are giving of their abundance. And here comes this poor widow who cast in two mites. These are evidently the smallest coins that they had at that period of time. As far as the value, not a whole lot of value, but Jesus thought it was valuable. And probably at that time, like today, nothing new under the sun, the rich will look down upon those who are poor, look down their noses upon them, but of course, Jesus did not, and he would not. But here is an event that he used. It wasn't just for him. It was for his disciples who were with him to teach them a lesson. Now, he does not, he does not criticize those who gave of their abundance but he doesn't commend them either. But he does commend that woman. I remember a, a classmate that I had in Memphis School of Preaching who could not understand this passage. To him, all he could see was the value as far as the abundance that these individuals gave much more than the woman did. They're the ones who should be receiving the praise. Well, he was wrong. He didn't get it, and he should have. They gave what they easily could afford to give. She gave of what somebody might have told her, oh, you can't afford to give all that. One brother in a a lectureship book mentioned, you know, she had two coins. She could have kept one for herself. And there had been nothing wrong with that. But we probably wouldn't be talking about her today if she had. She gave up her living. She gave up all that she had. She didn't have any more. And, of course, Jesus knew that, knew her heart she would continue to trust that God would provide, and undoubtedly, he did. Jesus is commending the quality of her gift compared to the quantity of what they gave. And that's what he wanted his disciples that would one day be apostles to understand. Is he pleased when we give sacrificially? Shake or nod, <laughs> yes, okay, yes, he is. He is, some, some are already nodding, but they're not, their heads aren't coming back up. However, he is pleased when we give sacrificially, even if it means we won't have the money to spend on all the luxuries of this life, because we are seeking after the kingdom first and his righteousness to continue the work that it'll keep on. So yes, again, he doesn't condemn those who are will, uh, wealthy of what they were able to give. But he doesn't commend them either. He does commend this woman casting in just two mites. It was the quantity. He's looking for the quality, I should say. He's looking for the quality of what we have to give to him. We can show up at services and every Sunday and Wednesday night we can show up, but if we're not really worshiping him in spirit and in truth, there's no quality in it. Maybe quantity, but not the quality. There's two more examples that I would like to mention. 
And these are examples of, now do a study for yourself. And go home sometime during this week, look up how many times Jesus actually commended someone and stated that they had great faith. See, how many times that shows up? And notice, who are these individuals? Well, one of these individuals, and that's a good study, by the way, one of these individuals was actually a Roman centurion. When we think of centurions, and you remember that Cornelius was one, we think about a, an officer who was over a hundred men. Well, not always. It just depends. Sometimes they may have only been uh, over 50. But generally it was 100. And you do any kind of study on centurions during the Roman Empire, and you come away with the idea, well, this was basically the cream of the crop. In our day, in our military, these were high-ranking NCOs. Uh, you could say a, a chief, master sergeant, a gunny sergeant in the Marine Corps, but very high ranking. And they got there for a reason. These were the individuals who would receive orders from their officers and direct the men how to follow them. They were the ones who trained the soldiers. They were the ones who were so many times first to go into the breach of a battle. But there also seemed to be a quality among centurions that may not have been seen by the average troops. Decent, a decent quality. Maybe had come from good families good people, especially as far as the world calls good. These were your average centurions. This one, without a doubt, Cornelius also had a good quality about him as well. But in Luke chapter 7, in verses 2 through 10, let's notice this account. Now remember, this really happened. This person lived. These events are true about him. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. He never personally met face to face with Jesus. And when they, that's the leaders, came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this. Now, this is Jews talking about a Roman soldier. You know, they hated the Gentiles, but they really hated the Rome. But not this individual. And the reason is found in verse 5, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. In the ASV it states, for he loveth our nation and himself built us our synagogue. He had the synagogue built for these individuals, these Jews. But let's continue on. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, now watch it. And turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. 
And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. From that very hour, from that very time, he had been healed. Well, let's talk about this account a little bit. As we might surmise, it was quite unusual for a Roman officer to humble himself and to ask help from a country that they had subjected their will upon, conquered, to come to an individual like that and ask for help. But this wasn't an ordinary centurion. You remember another account, the centurion at the cross of Christ, and the statements that he stated. One was that he believed that Jesus had been the Son of God. He must also have cared deeply for his servant. There was a bond. There was a, a form of love there that he had for the servant who was bedridden at this time and it sounds like near death. And undoubtedly he had heard about Jesus. Most people had at this period of time. He would have heard about the miracles that he was able to actually work. So he believed in what he had heard. By the way, that's called faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11, 1. So he had seen or heard of the evidence of the miracles that Jesus was actually able to perform. So he believed, seemingly without a shadow of a doubt, that this Jesus would be able to heal his servant that he cared deeply for. A good man, good reputation, even by Jewish standards. And on top of that, humble. Here's an individual who came into a conquered land and wanted to learn something about their culture, how they looked at things, how they viewed things. He would have known, as far as the custom, the difference between Jew and Gentile and how it would not look well for Jesus to come into his house. And he didn't want that. But again, it shows his humility. And you think about coming into a, a land and a people that you had conquered and you're going the extra mile to learn about them and doing these things for them, they would look at you differently as well. And they looked at him differently than they did other Roman soldiers. Are we not to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven to see a difference in us? How many people over the years who aren't Christians, who, who were not Christians, have obeyed because of the example someone set before them and they wanted to know more? And we all understand, and this is true, in the world that we live in, especially this world, when we set a godly example it will go noticed. People will see it. People can tell the difference between a faithful child of God and one who's just a worldly person. Light years of difference. He thought he was not worthy to even pursue Jesus personally or for Jesus to come into his house to heal his servant. Another thing, humility generally was not at the top of the list for Roman officers, especially to a conquered people. 
Look at your history. Read it. See how the Romans actually treated those that they had conquered. Read a little bit about the fall of Jerusalem. When they breached those walls, they were going to slaughter everybody. That's how much they hated them. And we should be humble. I always remember the words of Jesus, Matthew 23, 12, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself, he shall be exalted. Who's going to do the exalting? Christ will. God will. So the centurion had a humble attitude and simply a humble request. It wasn't for himself. It was for his servant. So he states basically that Jesus did not have to come to his servant for him to be healed. All he had to do was to give the order. You could say that our Lord's power was not hindered by distance. And here you have this Gentile. Here you have a Roman centurion who had more faith than the Jewish leaders at that period of time, probably all put together, who did not believe that he was the Son of God and had, well, they couldn't even spell the word humble. They were arrogant. If you've ever been in the military, you know how it works. When you receive an order, it's not like, well, maybe I'll do this. You would find out real quick why maybe was the wrong answer. There's something called KP that you might be doing peeling potatoes for two weeks. Or worse, lose money, lose a stripe. And you also know that just because you're a superior officer, even a high-ranking NCO, when they told you to do something, doesn't matter whether you wanted to or not, you carried it out, and they didn't even have to be there to personally give you that order for you, and they would expect you to carry that order out. This is, the, this is in the civilian world. You, have, you can't just quit and go home. They will come knocking at your door and will arrest you. So all, all Jesus had to do was to give the order, and he would be healed. Again, verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled. You could say he was astonished by this individual, a Gentile, a Roman, and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, which would have also included his disciples, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Not in all of Israel. Great faith, without a doubt. And he had great faith. Another account we could look at, and we will look at, is found in Matthew chapter 15. And there it begins in verse 21. This is another account of Jesus commending an individual for having great faith. Guess what? It's another Gentile. Wasn't a Jew. Wasn't a Sadducee. Wasn't a scribe. None of those individuals wasn't a Pharisee. It was a Gentile woman. Notice verse 22 of Matthew 15. Let's just 
go back to verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Mark's account is found in Mark 7, verses 24 through 30. Mark's account is a little differently. Matthew goes into more detail. Mark talks about how Jesus was trying to get away from people. He didn't want anyone disturbing him for a period of time. And in this chapter, Matthew 15, you go back and notice the conversation that he had with the scribes and the Pharisees. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, which was wrong. Teaching the commandments of men, the doctrines of men, their philosophy, instead of the law of Moses, the tradition of their elders. That's what they were teaching. In Mark's account, it also states that he had found a house. Matthew's, again, being a little bit different. Seems like maybe if they had found the house and she came and found him, maybe they had continued to walk a little further. And Mark's account refers to her as a Syrophoenician woman. This is that area around Tyre and Sidon, along the coast, but a Gentile. Verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. You know, when we look at the word coast, when we think about the coast living on the Gulf Coast, right next to the water, that's not what this word is saying. You think about a coast, it's a boundary between one country and another country. That would be a, a coast. And that's what it is with this. But he comes to him wanting him to heal her daughter. Was vexed grievously so with the devil, with a demon. We talked about a mother's love. Uh, last Sunday, and here's more proof of that, a mother's love. Well, what is interesting here, what jumps off the pages, is how she, a Gentile, refers to him as a Jew. What did it mean when she referred to him as the son of David? Again, she's a Gentile. She wasn't under the law of Moses. She didn't let, uh, live under the law of Christ. It wasn't in effect yet. So, as we noticed on Wednesday night, and this will be on the test, what law did she live under? A patriarchal law. That's the law of it that she lived under. As we noticed this morning, God hadn't given up on the Gentiles. But she referred to him as the son of David. That's the Messiah. That's who she's referring to him as. And again, the elite, the Jewish leaders, would say that about him. Definitely not in public. So she demonstrates her faith. That's the first step. That's what we first notice about this Gentile woman. Demonstration of faith. And though he would give in to her request, and of course he knew how it was going to turn out, it was God, yet it seems like he would test her faith, test her conviction, and more than once. Because at first he didn't say anything. Remember, his disciples are with him. They would have been watching and listening to everything that was taking place. Another object listen, uh, lesson. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. As, as if she didn't want, they didn't want her to be there. They didn't want her speaking out and crying out after them. 
Now, whether they uh, wanted him to give in to a request or just say, no, it, it doesn't stay. But sh they didn't want her around. So he doesn't say anything at first. Every once in a while, we also get tested. Our faith gets tested. The importance of count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, James 1, 2, and 3. By the way, if our faith was never tested, how would we really know whether we just had faith or not? whether it was average or whether it was great, if we were never pushed to the limit on something. We wouldn't. Notice verse 23. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, when he does respond, verse 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So again, could very well be another test. And what he stated was the truth, was it not? His earthly ministry was not to the Gentiles. It was to the children of Israel, the house of Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And if you think about it, the gospel of Christ would not go out to the Gentiles until you turn to Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. This may have been around 10 years after the gospel was taught in Acts chapter 2 to the Jews there in Jerusalem on Pentecost. So it would be probably around 10 years before it was finally taken to the Gentiles. Her reply is found in verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. I have often thought, reading these passages and studying them, personally, I think she had him at that very moment. How could he really say no? But she worshipped him. What does that word mean, to worship? What does the Greek sta uh, state? Basically, it means to lay prostrate. You're showing respect, obeisance to someone greater than you. Sometimes they would actually drop down onto their knees and bow and put the, their forehead onto the ground to show that kind of respect. You have to understand that she's begging for her daughter's life. And with that being said, what wouldn't she do? Showing the proper respect. Lord, help me. Kneeling before him, he would be looking down upon her. Remember, all his disciples are standing around watching and listening to this. Another lesson for them, no doubt about it. Who better to go to than the Lord? We sing a song from time to time. Where could I go but to the Lord? The importance of going to God in prayer supplication, asking, begging, casting all of our care upon him, knowing that he careth for us. So she went to the right individual. This also demonstrates her faith as well. She had faith in him. And understanding that we can go to our Father in heaven in prayer that's one of the beauties of being a New Testament Christian. The blessings to come boldly, confidently 
unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of what? In time of need, Hebrews 4.16. And never forget that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5.16. It avails a lot, but it won't if we don't pray to him. But here's where it really gets interesting. And this is Jesus' reply, and of all the replies that you might think he would give, he gave this one. And I think of him giving, a, I think of a, maybe a preacher giving this kind of reply today. You want to talk about a moving kind of sermon? You will be the one who's moving. He doesn't use it this way, but it does sound, uh, sound a little harsh. But in our day and time, if someone would have replied with this kind of answer, you probably got a lawsuit. If it's a member of the Lord's church, they're probably going to quit. This woman couldn't quit though. Her daughter still was grievously vexed with that demon, that devil. Mother's love. But notice his reply. He answered and said, this is verse 26, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Wow. That's rough. We all know that the Jews thought of the Gentiles as dogs. Paul even turned it around on them one time, beware of dogs. The concision. I do not believe that this is exactly what he meant here. I'm going to go out on the limb and state that he never sinned even in his thoughts, even in his words. So evidently this was not a sin to say this to this woman. Was he trying to make a point? Was he testing her one more time? Understanding his disciples were still there watching? You do a study on that word in this text here. One of the definitions is a small dog. The other is a puppy. You think about homes today. You've got a, a puppy in the house or you have a dog in the house that is beloved by the whole family. It will be taken care of. But it won't be taken care of, it won't be fed until the children have been fed. Then the dog would be fed with the scraps from their master's table. Now back at this period of time, you were not going to go down to the corner store and buy some Alpo, a bag of dog food. I don't even know if they have Alpo anymore. But uh, I know sometimes that smells better than some people's cookies. I've not had you, by the way. But I think he was trying to push her one more time. And what is truly remembered in all of this for almost 2,000 years is her reply. Of all things, she agrees. Her reply. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now think about it another way. He just mentioned this. It's not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now did she sit around and was she affronted? Did it take a while for her to speak up? I don't believe so. I think it was that quick. As soon as the words was out of his mouth, truth, Lord. That's true. It is true. However, basically, paraphrasing big time, 
it's not wrong for the dogs to receive the crumbs from their master's table. Now what is she saying? And don't, by the way, after this lesson say that was a really crummy sermon. I just know how some of you might think. She's quick. She didn't miss a beat in giving that answer. And I don't care how many times I read this and study it. I have to wonder, she's on her knees before him. He knows what she's going to say. But when she says it, I think he probably smiled at her. I really do. Pleased with what she had to say. Because of that, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour, that very minute she was healed. What an account. Great is thy faith. <coughs> Do a study on that. See how many times Jesus praises, commends someone for having great faith. Four commendations from Christ. Two of them were to Gentiles, a centurion and a woman. We need to be like Barnabas. Always encouraging. Always commending. All of these had some things that were, they all had in common. One's faith, the other was humility. We see it with the Gentile woman with the added bonus of perseverance. She wasn't going anywhere. Not until he gave in to her request. Faith, humility, perseverance. Sounds like a good sermon. That is what you and I are going to have to attain eternal life. The faith in God, being humble, and no matter what we're faced with, to persevere. Do we have that faith this afternoon? Do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do we have the humility to repent of our sins? To commend Him? To confess His name before others? To be baptized for remission of sins? Now would be the time to do that. If you have that kind of faith. As children of God, if we have fallen away, we know what we need to do. Do we have the humility to do that? To repent of sins? And then from then on, as we all should, to persevere, but no matter what we're faced with, knowing that our God is with us. You need to respond to the invitation this afternoon. We pray that you will come. Let's stand and sing.